reason I'm not seeing people. So I don't know. So, okay. Can you give me a thumbs up? If we you hear you. Me? Okay, good. Okay, welcome to the panel, Benny the Bomb Smashing the Patri Patriarchy. My name is Katia Confortini. I'm from Wellesley College and also a WILF member. Um, we have uh, our participants here with us uh, in this round table and I'll uh, introduce you all first. Maria Pia Devoto from Argentina. Uh, she um, is with Seguridad Humana in Latino America y el Caribe and also a member of ICANN. Karina Lester from the University of Adelaide, uh, also a member of ICANN Australia. And Cynthia Enlow, Clark University and Wilf uh, joining us via Zoom slash uh, WhatsApp. Uh, hopefully it'll go well. And finally, last but not least, Ray Hson, uh, Reaching Critical Will Program Director, also a uh, steering committee member of ICANN. Um, this round table is in celebration, both of the extraordinary achievement of ICANN's and uh, the extraordinary achievement of Ray with Ray's book, which documents the process of getting to the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which entered into force just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I want to say just a few words about the book, um, because then I want to give as much space to the actual protagonists of the story. Uh, I want to say that the book comes out with a Roman and Littlefield International soon. Um, and in the series Feminist Studies on Justice, Peace and Violence, which I co-edit with uh, Tina Vaitinen and Shweta Singh. And I think that at some point, Ray will have a flyer on the screen with the cover of the book and um, a discount for when it comes out. It's due to come out in June. I don't know if um, Ray can share the I, I can't share because you're sharing and we don't want to lose Cynthia, but I put the link and the discount code in the chat function. Oh, excellent. Maybe toward the end of the panel, we can uh, turn off uh, the screen, the screen sharing for me and uh, put um, your book on. Um, I'm going to say just a few book about a few words about the book and then I'll proceed with the question and I uh, questions. I, um, we have uh, kind of organized about 15 minutes minutes for each of the speakers so that we can have uh, some time for our uh, Q&A uh, at the end of the roundtable. Um, just so, first, a, a little bit about the book. I think it's a truly, truly extraordinary account of the painstaking work that needs to be put into convincing men and women in power to listen to feminist anti-nuclear activists. Um, of course, this is inscribed in the history and taking the lessons from decades of organizing for justice, um, but uh, what these activists show are also uh, that questions of peace and security cannot be divorced from questions around justice. Peace for the communities most impacted by the whole cycle of development, production and deployment on, of nuclear weapons, not to mention nuclear power, is inextricably linked to issues such as reproductive rights, economic security, environmental justice, and more. And also these activists show that the language of security used by nuclear states is in fact camouflaging a great number of insecurities and injustices. What these, the activists, and we have an, a, a wonderful representative set here, uh, what these activists were able to do was a feat that turned that language on its head and exposed its fallacies. Moreover, theirs was a triumph of resource, resourcefulness, diplomacy, education, political campaigning, alliance building that centered precisely on the people and communities thought to be irrelevant to international politics and security. And so it is to those activists that I want to now turn and to want to hear from. So I'm going to start with Ray, since this is a celebration also of your account. Uh, you're the, the director of the Reaching Critical Will, Will program of WILF, of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. 
and you have been involved with disarmament efforts for a long, long time. Uh, of course, the treaty is a massive achievement, but not the first of your achievements. So my first question is, what prompted you to write this particular book out of all the campaigns that you've been involved in about this particular process, other than, of course, the Nobel Prize that ICANN was awarded in 2017? Why Thanks so much to document the process of adopting the treaty and why in a specifically feminist way? Yeah, thanks a lot, Katya, and thanks to everybody else that is joining this panel today, too. Um, we really wanted to celebrate uh, the feminist activists who have been working on this treaty. I'm hearing an echo. Is anybody else? Yeah. Yes, I just muted it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so yes, so thanks to thanks to everybody else, and I'm looking forward to hearing from Pia and Karina about their experiences with this treaty making process as well, um, and to hear from Cynthia about her perspectives as a scholar. Um, why did I want to write this book? Well, this is, I think, one of the most feminist processes I've been involved in um, in my years of doing intergovernmental and activist work around the United Nations um, and at the grassroots level. Um, this is not to say, of course, that this process was in any way perfect or that our product was perfect, but um, it was a unique experience in many ways. Um, there's gonna be a lot of different perspectives and experiences of developing this treaty. And I really wanted to offer a specific feminist anti-militarist perspective because otherwise, as we well know, uh, a lot of written histories tend to diminish these perspectives. But feminism, and by this, and in the book, I try to make it clear that I mean an intersectional, post-colonial, queer feminism, is imperative to this treaty, even having been achieved. So it's not a lens that can be applied later on as an afterthought or something to analyze history, but it was actually an essential element of the treaty's origin story. Um, even if not everybody involved in the process would necessarily think about it that way or, or have that experience. But this is, for me, one of the most critical parts about um, the origins of this treaty. And I say this for a few reasons. First of all, Feminism is necessary to the critique of nuclear weapons that led to building this process to ban the bomb. A feminist post-colonial queer analysis says that nuclear weapons are the leading edge of the patriarchal militarist mindset, um, of the idea that might makes right, and that the best way to be secure in the world is to be able to commit massive genocidal violence, which is what nuclear weapons are. Um, they don't keep us safe. They have only ever caused harm. But this harm is largely and even completely in some circles discounted by the policy establishment elite because it's not harm to them. Um, they profit from nuclear weapons um, in terms of politics and military power and prestige, but also financially in terms of the investments in the companies producing these weapons um, and running the nuclear weapon complex. And they don't experience the effects of uranium mining or the fallout from nuclear testing or use or the storage of radioactive waste after it all. Um, and so they sort of, they discount the lived reality of nuclear weapons and they instead espouse theories about nuclear deterrence and strategic stability and geopolitics. And they treat these as gospel truths instead of theories and stratagems. Um, and without getting into a debate here about deterrence, because there's not time for that, the arguments from those that really put forward the need to ban nuclear weapons and promoted this process um, to ban them in international law, they've argued that we need to look at the material reality of nuclear weapons, which is exclusively harmful from development, testing, use, and um, the waste of economic resources as well on these weapons, and that they make the world more dangerous and more at risk um, with all the tensions that we have. And the other reason that I think that um, feminism was so instrumental to this process to ban nuclear weapons is because feminist understandings of power help us sort through the myths and the challenges 
um, that, you know, the supposition that nuclear weapons are about security and many feminist scholars have done a lot of work on this issue. I'm thinking of Catherine Eschel and Carol Cohn and Felicity Ruby and Sarah Reddick and many others. Um, and really looking at how nuclear weapons have been talked about by their possessors, um, how the nuclear armed state officials talk to disarmament activists, but also even to diplomats from non-nuclear armed countries. Um, we were told throughout this process that we were irrational, um, that uh, that the countries promoting the ban treaty um, had no real security interests in the world. Um, this was an initiative that was largely led by countries of the global south. And so there was also a very colonial racist as well as a patriarchal element to their um, to the nuclear armed state opposition to this treaty. Um, and we were also told very clearly multiple times in writing uh, in official documentation that we were being emotional for wanting to talk about the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and for wanting to outlaw these weapons the same way that other weapons of mass destruction like biological and chemical weapons have already been outlawed. That was described as being emotional. And I just don't know how you get more patriarchal than that in an international forum. Um, of course, from a feminist perspective, this, this attachment that we can see to nuclear weapons is what's irrational and in many ways emotional, this idea that nuclear weapons um, provide the ultimate guarantee of security and strength and power in the world. Um, but the policy elite have spun the narrative so tightly that they try to make everyone else ridiculous and, and silly for wanting discernment. Um, and I think that one day this will be flipped and it will be obvious that it was absolutely atrocious that nuclear weapons ever existed and persisted for this long. Um, but for now, it's up to feminists to do the work of pulling back this particular curtain and exposing um, what's behind it. And this is what feminism does, right? It teaches us about contesting power, about the bravery that's necessary to do that and to undercut power and to confront and challenge dominant narratives. Um, it teaches us that what we're told is set in stone is not, that what we're told is the natural order of things is not. And that's also where I think a queer analysis is very important, that we don't take things as a given, that we're always contesting, challenging, interrogating um, the myths of this is how the world works and those assertions um, that are always put to us and really asking why, why is it that way? Why isn't it this way? Why can't we do something different? And this making change or progress is about shifting the perception about what is realistic, what is realism and what is reality and what is possible. Um, possible doesn't mean likely. Hope doesn't mean a guarantee of success, but what it means is that what we have right now is fundamentally wrong. It is harming people. It is not working. It is creating massive injustice in the world. And by working together, by building something different, we can change this. Um, so I think these are all of the reasons why I believe that this process to ban nuclear weapons and develop this treaty um, it was a, a feminist process, and um, this isn't something that's going to solve all problems of nuclear weapons immediately, and I tried to make that clear through the book as well. But like all other social movements and like the feminist project itself, um, it's iterative, right? We have steps forward, you get pushed back, pushed around, put down, you make more gains. It's an ongoing struggle, and no one victory solves the problem. It takes generations of persistent relentless action, but feminists are very good at that. Thank you so much, Ray. I, I would have so many other questions, but I, I think that I would move to Pia and Karina uh, now and um, feel free to either either one of you to answer the question, but eventually I would like both of you to do. And um, given what, just, uh, what Ray just said about the importance of feminism, or, or a feminist analysis of, uh, of the process, I was wondering if you can tell us a bit about your, how did feminism influence your own engagement in the process to ban nuclear weapons? And 
what kind of impact it had on your in on the anti nuclear activism in specific contexts in your specific locations. I should I choose between Pia, <laughs> Maria, Pia, and Karina? Karina, you go. You're you're showing my you're showing first okay. in my screen. So. Okay, lovely. Okay, thank you, lovely. Katia, thank and, you. and thank you, ladies. I really appreciate this opportunity to share with you all um, our little story from from Australia in in outback South Australia. Um, that's where I'm coming live from here, just before sunrise, um, and before the flies all take me away. But um, our story is a story, I guess, of survival. I'm a second generation survivor of British nuclear testing in South Australia in the 50s. Um, and my people were exposed to a, the first mainland test that happened in Australia at the location of Emu Fields. And um, that would be about 100 k's where I'm sitting today um, is where we had the test taken place and north of there was the main camp of my family and my people and so we had the highest radiation fallout over our main camp and many of my older generation um, were exposed to that fallout as well um, and so my story is just keeping the story alive and ongoing knowing the lived experience by my people um, how people suffered from those tests in South Australia, um, stories of survival from my amazing grandparents and also my father's generation as well. And, you know, I think having that leadership and, and those role models in front of me of, of my grandmothers and, you know, my father's story as well has really um, kept those stories alive within me to continue to share to the world um, our stories of um, survival, but also the struggles that we are faced with as well um, here in Australia. Um, a lot of those locations were out of sight, out of mind, and um, no real understanding of people using those traditional lands as our um, lands of spiritual connect that we have, our hunting, our gathering, our you know cultural practices. Um, British governments of the day, Australia and, and the UK, the British government didn't really understand the connect that people have um, through that. There was one particular patrol officer, so one individual that needed to cover thousands of square kilometres to inform people and language was going to be the number one barrier because the one patrol officer couldn't speak our Bidinjara Yangunjara language, our Western Desert dialect. And so we were never consulted. We were never given the opportunity to have a say in what was being, um, I guess, uh, cooked up or arranged by the British and uh, an Australian government. So from the very beginning, we were, um, I guess, not involved in the process and no consent was given from Aboriginal people. And my grandmothers were very instrumental in, in being leaders of you know, speaking up strong about what happened in the British nuclear testing, but also the ongoing issues that we're faced with here in Australia as well. So issues such as um, waste dumps, um, and in some of the traditional lands in South Australia, they are mining uranium also. And so many of us Aboriginal people and First Nations of Australia um, are, are suffering from the impacts of industry from the mining of uranium on our traditional lands um, to waste dumping on our traditional lands and it's a current debate that we're faced with here in South Australia as well um, further south from where I am currently located um, in the traditional lands of the Bungala community um, Bungala people are faced with a pressure from our federal government to be the location to store nuclear waste in their traditional lands. So we certainly have been standing in solidarity with them to support um, and stand together to say no to waste dumping in South Australia. Um, my grandmothers were heavily involved in that back, goodness me, 
1998 was when uh, the Australian government put pressure on us in South Australia again. And in 1998 to 2004, my grandmothers were heavily involved in um, campaigning through what was known as the Eradi Wandi campaign. And Eradi means poison and Wandi means leave it. And so this campaign was really important. And I guess it was the start of my my activism and my work. I always had the story as a second generation survivor. I grew up with my father who was blinded from the British nuclear tests. And then I had my amazing grandmothers who were really strong, powerful women to block um, government of storing nuclear waste in our traditional lands. That's been an ongoing journey for myself um, and a generational story as well for us in Australia in that there's been other, um, I was going to say curveballs or other really important issues that have come up around the whole nuclear industry. Um, our state government decided to run a royal commission in 2015 um, against looking at, you know, again, looking at the nuclear fuel cycle and wanting to dump nuclear waste in outback South Australia. Another bit of activism work that we needed to get involved in and, and again, Aboriginal people and First Nations people of Australia standing together and, and sending the strong message of no, no nuclear waste dump in our state. Um, we, we also had to campaign against, again, this national waste dump issue, which is on our um, doorstep now. And it's another struggle and it's been an ongoing generational struggle for us from my grandmothers to my late father and my sister and myself um, being actively involved. Um, and parts of my story and my journey has also been leading into the banning of the bomb as well, where ICANN has played a real um, crucial role in allowing us to get our voices, our Aboriginal voices in Australia out to the rest of the world and hear those stories of survival from my people as well. And so it's been ongoing um, and I think it'll be still ongoing for generations. And, you know, I'm a mother of four and I have, you know, I do what I do for my beautiful children to have a world of peace, you know, full of peace and, and a world free of nuclear weapons. So um, it's been a generational struggle for us over decades of working with the, you know, campaign and activism work that we do here in South Australia as well. So um, that's a, a small insight into some of the work we do in South Australia. Nice and early. Back into, okay. Um, I think that I would like to hear from Maria Pia now. How did feminism influence your engagement in this process and what kind of impact does feminism have in your specific context? Um, for both also, I just also throw another question. Uh, what is the value for you to collaborate with feminist activists with, in different countries on these issues? And I think, Karina, you've already uh, touched on this, but if you think about it, um, if you want to say something more after Maria Pia has spoken. Hey, well, hello, good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> I don't know where, wherever you are. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, really a pleasure being part of this uh, roundtable, uh, especially after listening like uh, this powerful uh, uh, words from from Karina and and uh, maybe one thing as being from Latin America, I, I from Argentina, it's a uh, it's a completely different context, um, but still it's, it's a, a conservative uh, area. It's a conservative like uh, region. Uh, we have like a strong presence of the Catholic church. Uh, and in, in my country, despite uh, having like recent uh, 
uh, recent success, like the approval of the abortion, there is still some 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 challenges. I I don't know. Like last 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 week, a very young woman were stabbed to death to death, uh, eighteen years old, and she did eighteen claims, and her former boyfriend is was a policeman. He already had uh, claims for violence he already had uh, uh, also like a conviction of a rape of a younger uh, handicapped girl so it's 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 crazy so uh, in one side you see that uh, all the movement things are changing and the other side you sit down and and, and think like uh, what happened what happened, where was the police, where was the justice, where was the minister of gender, where, where was, an, and, uh, and, and there is this, these things are changing because of the feminist groups and from activism from, from thousands of women and men. Uh, and, and so I think that, that, that things are, are changing and we have in our region like an, an um, historical, and a structural uh, inequality of gender, you know? and and this you can maybe another in in in, in all our region, and, and this you can add intersectionality like uh, your race, your religion, your or your sexual orientation, and 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 violence weapons is a men's issue, and it's associated with uh, strength, it's associated with courage, it's associated with power, it's associated of uh, domination and and this is what nuclear weapons are it's like uh, it's it's a, it's a false idea of security it's a symbol of power it's a small group of country dominating all the rest of the world because they have nuclear weapons and and although there is more and more international recognition and uh, to have like in everything like a gender approach and and you also have like more side events you see language in every resolution you see also a specific i don't know in the arms trade treaty that rachel uh, rachel uh, ray also participate there is like a specific article that says that you cannot transfer uh, weapons to a country if that they can be used or is a, a suspicion that can be used in gender based violence. so it's it's there there are some things that is uh, in, in we have the national uh, plans on the 1325 the Secretary General Disarmament Agenda. During in the in the international arena, there there is a lot of examples and advancement. But it, but anyway, despite all this, nuclear policy, weapons, foreign policy, is a still a men's issue. So, I am a disarmament activist, uh, and uh, for me, feminism is part of myself. Is uh, inherent, is uh, on me, is inside me, and uh, it's no, it's not something that you think that you need to be or it, it's something that is with you and is uh, in everything you approach and all approach that you have is uh, it's a feminist approach and with it with a gender approach and uh, it's in professional life but it's also in personal life is how i live is how my family lives is how i raise my kid my child is how you raise your child. Is how you raise, and it's everyone's how they if they choose to have child, how they raise it. So I think that we have like a, the the future is promising. It's not a symbol that uh, I I, um, I identify myself as a disarmament activist, and it's not a symbol because it, it it's what, what we're talking about is just to deconstruct this idea of uh, weapons, violence, and masculinity. Masculinity. So is that what we are trying to do? And it's why I'm identified myself as a disarmament activist. Thank you for the question. Um, I hope that you don't have, so how, what about the value of collaborating uh, with feminist movements and anti-nuclear movements all in other countries, I bet that there's going to be some commonalities, but also differences. What, what were the challenges and rewards? Um, if I can think of Argentina, for sure, uh, 
your words, Maria Pia, resonated a lot with me because the problem of femicide is very, very strong in Italy as well. And we share some dynamics. But um, yeah, for you too, Karina, what, what, was, what were the rewards, but also the challenges of working across different context, contexts as feminist activists? Yeah, absolutely. That's been quite crucial for us here in Australia to um, build those relationships with everybody. Um, I met Ray through the campaign work with ICANN. So, you know, that's joined dots and, and Ray's approached me to be part of this panel. So that's been really important for us to get our voice out. And we call ourselves Arnongo. Arnongo is the term we use for um, Aboriginal people from that Western Desert area. And we, we are often seen to be sort of out of sight, out of mind or too remote. Um, and it was really important for us to um, have those connects with organisations such as I can, but even, you know, the connect that I have with my people. I do what I do because of the support my people give me um, to be the one to carry the voice and take their voices and their stories and their messages out to the wider world. And I can has been a great platform for us to do that. It's a story um, that I've realised that our story is such a common story around the globe. Um, and it's these opportunities to link up and network and collaborate with, you know, other feminists around the world of getting our stories because our stories are from first-hand experience. You know, my people suffered and still to this day suffer. And so it's been really crucial for us to have those relationships and those collaborations to get the stories out. And, you know, with this treaty in place, it, it does, it recognises the disproportionate impact on Indigenous peoples. Um, and so, you know, the nuclear weapons and the activities of that has been huge on Indigenous peoples around the globe. And a lot of the women are the ones that are standing up and speaking up about this globally. Um, and it's been comforting to know that there is support and there's that safety in numbers for us because quite often we're, you know, in Australia, we're a minority and, you know, Indigenous issues, are, you know, in Australia are sort of not a, a key priority and at times in, in government and, and that relationship that we have, you know, through colonisation and the histories of Australian history um, is a huge challenge. But I feel with the activism work and working with other feminists around the world, it's been um, comforting to know there is that that safety in numbers and that my voice is, is very important to the bigger picture. And, you know, we saw that on the 22nd of January 2021, where it became international law. And I have to say it was a very emotional day. And I certainly had tears in my eyes as well to you know, have been a part of the whole campaign and working with amazing women and men out there, you know, doing all this amazing work and talking about stories of survival and struggle and, you know, to, to see that it has now become international law. But, you know, we are now aware that we still have a lot of work here in Australia to do to get our country to sign on the treaty as well. So, um, you know, we're certainly not blindsided, but we certainly know that there is a lot of work for us. And again, it'll be a lot of the women and activisms, you know, the women who do this activism work, who were talking up strong to really put the pressure on, on our Australian government here to get them to sign and be part of it because of those, again, those stories of survival as well. So it's been really, really important for us to get our voice in remote South Australia, where I am, I'm about a thousand kilometres away from a major city, um, which is Adelaide. And so we're quite remote. I'm in Central Australia. And, you know, that voice being able to link in events like this is, is really important for us to share and, and build connects and, and meet people through virtual ways, new technology, which is, um, you know, amazing. And I think it's been really important, you know, that as the forum is, it's about feminists connecting and, and this has been a wonderful opportunity. So thank you all. It's quite exciting indeed for everybody. 
<clears throat> Maria Pia, do you want to say also something? As, as, as many of you, and uh, I am a member of uh, and Women's Network, and, 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 and even like I coordinate some. And uh, I find extremely powerful work with other, but extremely powerful, especially with feminist activism, because the sorority, solidarity, the sisterhood, it's like um, among feminists, and it's, it's one of the strongest, reliable, collective groups I've ever met. It's incredible despite our difference how we can work together but what but i think that what we need to think is how we can work together to we are of course very frustrated because there are some countries that, that are not joining the treaty there are some uh, nuclear um powers that they are not compliance with uh, the npt with with their obligations in 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 the summer so i think that a gender approach and working together it's and and uh, enlarge our participation um, actively participate it's something that goes it, it, it's, it, we are going to we are going to 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 succeed and and it's, it's not only like of course in, increase the number of women in every forum because there's no guarantee like just to be a woman to have a gender approach i i remember the like um um well participating in in many international forums You've listened like how women saying how guns protect themselves and how uh, nuclear weapons protects uh, uh, American housewives. You 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 can listen things like that. So it's 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 not like uh, participating. It's like us participating in in this process. And and I think that we have like a next lunch panorama in, at the beginning of the 2021. With the entry into force of the of the of the Bond Treaty, I think that uh, it's a good sign. Like extension, there are things that uh, we can do uh, together, and and we can have like just to work together for sure. I guess. I guess that I'm gonna switch to Cynthia now. I'm gonna leave you the last word, Cynthia. And the question I have is, given what we heard from this amazing feminist, I really love the idea of feminist reliable collective power. Uh, given what we've heard from uh, uh, them, what? how do you as feminist scholars situate the work of ICANN and more specifically the process to ban nuclear weapons in this feminist transnational activism and what what can what can other movements learn from this movement well first of all, i want to say thank you to um everybody to uh, maria pia and to karina and to ray and to katia for organizing us and getting us all on the same zoom screen well at least i'm on the same phone and the same Zoom screen. But I can see you, that's the important thing. And then I just want to kind of give a, a shout out to everybody who's joined the panel as a listener and a learner, um, because that's really, it's important that we are all five of us here together, but it's really crucial that everybody who has joined the IFJP um, panel uh, as a listener is really taking on board these ideas. I, one of the things that is striking to me is um, how little, this is now not to the five of our teachers here today um, who are teaching us about nuclear weapons and gender and feminist analysis, but to everybody out there who teaches um, international relations, um, who is a student of international relations in a graduate program or a recent postdoc or getting your first job or maybe you're in your first job, um, how many of us um, make nuclear weapons part of a gender and IR course? Or if you're teaching an ordin quote, ordinary IR course, where is nuclear weapons? Do you find yourself thinking, oh, I don't know enough about that. Oh, I'm not sure how I can approach that. It's too technical for me. Um, it just doesn't seem as though there's any entry point for me, and therefore I'm leaving it off the syllabus. Um, or I'm only putting it on when I can talk about uh, the big uh, nuclear 
holding states, and then I'll talk about their strategic uh, formula. But I won't try to use my own feminist curiosity to take it apart. And what I think Ray and um, Maria Pia and Karina have taught us today, and how Ray's book will teach us more, but also go to the ICON uh, website and learn how they organize and how they campaign. They really are showing us how we can um, be part of this conversation, part of this learning uh, network, and teach our students about it. It's really crucial that students don't think that feminists don't know how to talk about nuclear weapons. And I my hunch is that most of our students don't think that we know how to talk about it, and we don't teach them skills of how to talk about it. And one of the great advantages of adopting a feminist uh, approach to anything is that you take it apart. You don't leave it in its monolithic, uh, obscure form where only experts, in quotes, um, can talk about it. You don't do that. You start looking at nuclear waste dumping. And you look at nuclear waste dumping every place where it's being dumped, in the Pacific, in the American uh, Southwest, in uh, South Australia. You look every place in the world where nuclear waste is being dumped, and you then ask your students to join with you to research. So who gave whose consent to that? And who didn't? And what are the campaigns like? And are there campaigns? And are they campaigns that most of us don't know about? Or mining? Most of us don't know much about mining. A lot of environmental feminists know about mining. A lot of people who do uh, really good work on development distortions know about mining. But oftentimes we don't think mining is part of international politics, but of course it is. And so we need to ask gender questions about mining, about uranium mining. Who's, who's a miner? Who, who is an owner? Who is a contractor? Who's the client? And we know how to do that. I mean, we do it with the government industry. Why can't we do it with the nuclear industry? It's not remote and obscure and only accessible to experts. Again, always in quotes. Uh, it's something we know a lot more about than a lot of people do. Uh, that is, we know how to investigate. Um, and treaty making is not obscure. Treaty making is ratification state by state. So what is happening in Argentina? What is happening in Australia? We know how to investigate uh, debates over foreign policy. Well, treaty making, rejection um, or ratification, both, um, those are processes that are deeply gendered. Uh, and we need to know more about that, and we need to teach our students about it. So I think our, and I'm including myself here, um, our sense that we can talk about gun violence, which more and more of us now know we have to talk about gun violence, but not about the big weapon system, that's just not excusable anymore. And I'm critiquing myself here. Um, it's thanks to Ray um, that I'm really even in this session. And I'm in the session as a learner um, and a very embarrassed learner. Um, and if we can talk about other forms of violence, which we've all learned we have to talk about, or you can't talk about any kind of politics, local, national, or international, well, that means we can talk about um, big weapons, because big weapons are not just boys' toys. And if they are boys' toys, then we're very smart in knowing how to investigate boys being boys. That's one of the things that we're very good at. Um, and so we need to really kind of shape up here. And again, I'm looking at myself on the screen and saying it to myself. Uh, it needs to be part of every gender and IR course. We need to have new research. And if, you're, if we're doing research on violence, then we've got to include um, nuclear weapons. And most of us, at some point, either study or teach or write or all three about social movements. Well, ICANN should be right up there at the top. Um, how has it gone about, thanks to Ray and to uh, Dimity and then to, um, to Felicity, um, how 
how do you create a non-patriarchal international anti-weaponry campaign? How do you do it? Um, and what are the pitfalls? And what are the rewards? So I'm, I'm just um, so I'm embarrassed, which is always a good starting place. Um, and then I'm also energized, which is even better. So thank you all very much, and I hope to all the listeners out there that um, you'll clean up your syllabus, you'll clean up your uh, research uh, agenda, you'll clean up um, your uh, passivity, and take on uh, ICANN's lessons about how to tackle uh, nuclear weapons to make us all smarter, which is what feminism always does. Thank you so much, Cynthia. <laughs> you're always inspiring. If you're embarrassed, I don't know what I feel like. Then. <laughs> uh, I I think that um, I would like to open it for quest to questions for the audience. Uh, humor, horror, and hope. I can <laughs> love it, Karina. Thank you. So, if anybody has questions for any of our speakers, and um, I think that I also would like. Um, Ray to be able to share the screen um, so that uh, she can she can uh, show the cover of the fabulous book and the discount code for everybody who wants to and should buy it. And a sign. Yes. Okay, so I will. I, I have no sense of who's of who's uh, um, who's attending. Yes, so we have 11 attendees and then the six panelists, uh, which I'm included. I, I also would like to give a shout out to Leila and Celia and Carrie, but especially Leila in this session, because thank you for switching from uh, microphones. <laughs> Otherwise, we, it just wouldn't thank be you. possible. <laughs> Uh, if I move the uh, presenter, move the presenter to uh, Ray, then you will be removed from the sharing screen, just so you know. Is that okay or? Okay or... All right, then I will just go ahead. Thank you. That's the, that's the image. That's it. <laughs> I think we have a question from Sam Cook. Um, she says, I think connecting, connecting issues across silos is one of the key strengths of feminist organizing. What are some of the unexpected connections that have allowed you to push your work forward? Is that to anybody? Is that? No, it, it was just general for anyone. Okay. Sorry, I'm having issues now that my screen is sharing. <laughs> I think this is the problem with seeing anything that you were having, Katya. Everything else has disappeared from my screen. Um, I can I can take a quick stab at that, but I'd love to hear what, what Pia and Karina have to say as well. Um, yeah, I think one of the one of the questions that we often get or that I often get working on nuclear weapons is why on earth do you work on nuclear weapons? Um, and I think a lot of people don't really see um, nuclear weapons as an urgent threat the way that maybe 
um, previous generations have, particularly in the 1960s and the 1980s, um, thinking about the height of the Cold War, you know, there was over 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world at that point, and tensions between the Soviet Union and the US were high, and there was books and movies and pop culture about nuclear war, and so it was in people's minds as an urgent threat. Um, and a lot of that has dissipated, and that's largely a deliberate strategy of the policy elite to make it a non-issue in the public eye. Um, but there's still over 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world. All nine of the nuclear armed states are currently engaged in massive modernization programs, which is their euphemistic way of saying that they're investing billions of dollars into extending their nuclear arsenals, building new types of nuclear weapons um, and other technologies in the, in the nuclear complex. And all of these resources are coming at the expense of everything else. I mean, the United States, for example, is spending about $50 billion a year on its nuclear weapons right now. And that's not, that's not an issue that's being discussed in public as we're grappling with COVID and the lack of, of, of equipment and um, vaccines. And we have, you know, 50 billion that's going towards the nuclear arsenal. Um, and the lived reality um, that people were more aware of uh, in previous generations has been swept under the rug as well. So everything that Karina talked about in terms of the struggles and the suffering of her community, um, and that's been replicated all over the world, um, mostly in colonial contexts, mostly on indigenous land where nuclear weapons have been tested. And um, that has left a legacy of horror behind that um, a lot of people aren't aware exists if you don't live in those communities. Um, and so it's been a deliberate sort of shushing up of the nuclear weapon issue, um, but the threat persists. And really um, the, the way that international relations are or is organized around violence um, is has nuclear weapons at the pinnacle in terms of who gets to speak, who gets to be taken seriously, who can throw their weight around, weight around in international circles. Um, a lot of it comes down to nuclear weapons. And so this is why connecting nuclear weapons to other issues is so important to put them in the context of the money being spent. Um, and where those wasted resources are, but also to look at nuclear weapons in the continuing continuum of violence. And Cynthia, I thought, spoke very well about this in terms of thinking about how feminists talk about gun violence, but not about nuclear violence. Um, but also we can put nuclear weapons in the context of police brutality, of the racism that is inherent in police brutality in the prison industrial context, we can connect the way that nuclear weapons organize our politics into that same frame. We can think about nuclear weapons in the context of climate change and the fact that these are sort of known as twin existential threats that could destroy our planet and the world um, and the ways in which uh, nuclear weapons would massively exacerbate climate change if even one weapon is used again. Um, and so these are all the different connections that that we can make um, that I think are really, really important and that make nuclear weapons more of a salient topic for people and help people think through how it does connect to their daily lives and what the meaning is down to how we organize ourselves, how we think about power, how we think about safety and security, and are we thinking about it in the context of collective cooperation and understanding and building community, or are we thinking about it as I need the biggest weapons, the most destructive weapons in order to protect myself? And, the, and that goes through so many different conversations and things that we work on. So to add to that, I think that something that really helped uh, all of us and, and to bomb the bomb is to have like the humanitarian perspective. And that that, that is a, like a stronger connection, like the where the impact, uh, where this, this, this way of negotiating and at the international uh, multilateral at the United Nations or, or, or other forums, it's like, uh, how is the impact that uh, a weapon can have 
uh, not only not, not only to the people but also to communities and also to the environment and uh, that is something that is it's a it's a reunion of uh, where we from where we can build our our partnership and and work to push forward uh, banning the bomb and the other thing that i think that is interesting is uh, I one of the, for example, one of the women's network I am member is an environmental network, and uh, from before uh, me being part of that uh, of, of of that network, uh, none of them that works uh, there uh, ever heard about the can what is the impact that a nuclear weapon can have in the environment. So I think that is. We need to use all the, the the connections and all the opportunities that we can we can have, like just to bring the issue and to have more and more uh, people, uh, not only women or feminists, just to have like a, more and more people uh, working and 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 pushing their own uh, governments and in their own agendas and and trying because it's it's a matter of, it's it's also about us. It's also about me. It's not only. Oh, it's something that is going to uh, fire away. It's, it's, if something happens, uh, we're going, all of us, we're going to be affected. So I think that that is the way that we need to, to the, the entry point that we have. If I could just pick up on both Ray and Pia. Um, I think one of the big messages that I took from the Erade Wandi campaign and the campaign my grandmothers led was that it was an issue for everybody. And Nana were, those old women were really concerned about people like truck drivers who were transporting the nuclear waste and, you know, their families. And so we really looked at making it an issue for everybody. It wasn't just a black issue here in Australia that Aboriginal people were needing to deal with. It was an issue that was needed to be addressed by all Australians um, because of transport routes and locations of where they were going to be traveling through and, and where the waste was going to be stored. So it was a real big learning curve for myself as well. But also just to continue the story of their survival and their responsibility. And that was something really big from the campaign as well about our Arnogo responsibility, which is our cultural responsibilities to us as a whole, but then also to the environment and to our important stories um, that zigzag and crisscross through our countries as well. Um, they're important stories of survival. They're stories that are so part of our culture and our identity as well. And a lot of my beautiful grandmothers took that responsibility strong because of their responsibilities to culture and identity and knowledge and caretaking and, you know, being nurturers. And so they were huge messages from those old women of, of mine who, you know, were able to speak again, as Pia was saying, about that humanitarian um, perspective, that they were women who were leaders and very knowledgeable. And that was something I certainly took away. But again, it was really important for us to reach out to other areas. So I've spoken to school groups as well to talk with children about the issue as well. Um, so just join, joining those dots and making those connects has been really important to you know, reach out. And as Ray and Pierre and others have said that it's right across or a lot of areas and a lot of sectors such as climate change. And, you know, we talk about lots of other issues on um, disarmament and so forth as well. So we've got to um, talk about it and keep the conversations alive and, you know, ongoing for, you know, to get people aware of the issues faced by people who are survivors and have that firsthand experience of testing and, and you know, look at Japan, you know, survivors, Hibakusha over there, you know, their stories have been so powerful in this whole treaty to ban nuclear weapons. So really looking at it right across all sectors and across the board as well. Hi, Katya. Yes, <laughs> sorry, you we're disconnected. Um, yeah, don't worry. Okay, don't worry. I have another question here. Uh, from Meredith Forsyth, 
what advice might you give to the next generation of feminists taking up the issue, taking up this cause? What needs to happen next? Maybe I can jump in on that one, Katia, and just speak, I guess, from an Australian perspective. And as a young, you know, Arnonga woman from Australia, I think, you know, I, I really want to reach out to my own people as well and, and, and let them know in, in our language, in our traditional language, the stories of survival, because we're all descendants of those people who were exposed to British nuclear testing. So I really want to remind my own mob about those horrific stories, um, but then also get them confident and, and competent to be able to speak up about this because sometimes it is a really challenging and, and awkward issue and you know we all know the language that does get thrown around you know we're being too emotional and so forth but you know to build those skills around my own people to feel that they have a voice in this debate that their voice can be heard in Australia in the state of South Australia in Australia and around the globe as well um, and that's what I hope to work closely with my people here in Australia and reach out to that next generation um, to let them know that, you know, connecting and, and joining those dots is um, a way. And as I mentioned before about the um, safety in numbers and, and feeling that, you know, security around that our story is a big part of the global story as well. So, you know, I, I think it's reaching out to my own mob and, and to, you know, First Nations people across this country um, about these issues around the nuclear and around this industry as well. There is like a, a set of uh, ideas that can have like uh, advice, what, what we can do, what do next. Um, if you have, if everyone can do something, like uh, just uh, from, if you have like 10 minutes, if you have one hour, if you have a whole day, uh, but you need to do like a lot of efforts to include the approach, the feminist approach in the nuclear field. Like if you are a researcher, okay, do more research on that. If you are a teacher, teach more on that. If you are a, a, an activist on other issues, like include, uh, this issue in your in your claims. If you um, um, if you are a, a journalist, just uh, put this. If if you are an influencer, if you are a TikToker, I don't know. Like just use the, everything, every tool. Um, we as as you know, we we have uh, uh, the traditional social media, but uh, as mothers and at the office as mothers of teenagers, uh, we are developing like uh, and having like a TikTok to teach in in other way. I, I don't know how to do it. I have to confess. <laughs> I don't know. But it just to have like a I like a different uh, approach like how to approach uh, very young people. So I think that, that is the things that everyone can do and we can do and and and, as, and, and contact the other groups of feminists. And as I said, like before, uh, in, in this um, environmental network, they, they don't ever uh, thought about the idea of what could be the impact of a nuclear weapon to the environment. So I think that we need like just to to put the issue in, on, on the table and our and our daily life and, and our professional life uh, as well, so we can be like a, this collective uh, group that I, I was speaking before. Yeah, um, I'm going to put in the chat a few of the initiatives and campaigns that ICANN has underway right now, um, which are really practical things that students can engage in, but also activists of all ages can support um, most of that work. There's one that's focused on universities, but the rest are, are more general. Um, so, yeah, I'll put that there. Um, so there's some links there. Um, and information, but more broadly, I think one of the most important things that I've learned as a feminist activist working in 
this strange space of the United Nations um, and, you know, kind of crossing the lines between grassroots activism and coalition building around the world and then working with diplomats and then also sometimes working with academics and, um, yeah, kind of hopping all over the place and working with so many different people is is really the importance of building community um, with people who are like minded who who are willing to open their minds also to to new ideas that is really how we achieved this treaty more than anything else is building up a sense of community and a sense of trust amongst individual people that really wanted to make a change in the world and were willing to take the risk to do that um building that up amongst the diplomats amongst the activists and the international organizations that that were part of this and making each other feel like we had community that we were safe and secure that we could talk about the challenges of our campaign and of the work that we were doing um, with each other and hold each other to account in those spaces all of that is incredibly important and it can be difficult at first. Um, so I think the one thing that I try to when I'm talking to students that I always say is don't assume that you're the only person in the room thinking a certain way. If you're in a room full of men in suits at the United Nations, for example, and they're talking about strategic stability and um, the, the necessity of, of nuclear weapons, you know, um, uh, you're not the only one who thinks that that is strange and wrong. And if you speak out against it, it might be very uncomfortable the first time that you do it um, to call that to account and to, to challenge it. Um, but I guarantee you other people in the room are going to come up to you afterwards and start talking to you about it and you start building community. So that's one of the most important things I learned is the, the value of being the rebel rousal, rebel rouser, even though it's really, really hard to do it sometimes in the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that would be some straightforward advice, I think, that applies to more than just nuclear weapons. Cynthia, do you want to say something about that too? Well, I need to move. Um, exactly the point that Ray just made. Um, that you, the normal looks normal until somebody blows the whistle. And as soon as somebody blows the whistle, whether it be in Argentina or Australia or inside the UN, uh, General Assembly or a meeting room next door or wherever you are, somebody has the nerve um, to say that what is claimed to be rational is actually insane. And then all of a sudden the insanity is exposed and people start talking about it. And that's exactly how the Me Too movement has been um, moving around from country to country and sector to sector, is that nobody thought that harassment in the workplace was something to talk about. And then somebody started talking about it, and I got a lot of people had knowledge. I think, Cynthia, I don't think that we can hear you. Can you hear Cynthia? No, Cynthia. Hold on. I don't know why, but. I cannot hear you anymore. Try. I think it disappeared. Sorry, Cynthia. I guess that was the last. Uh, <laughs> we won't have we won't have the last of your wisdom uh, for today. We cannot hear you. I don't know why. I'll try to call you again. I think that I also would like, I see that among the participants, there are uh, people whose work uh, um, Ray has cited and mentioned um, 
at the beginning of this talk and also in her book, I see Carol and um, Carol Cohn and um, Catherine Eschel, but I also see some fellow Wilfers that have joined uh, the panel and that have been involved in one way or another, like Sam Cook and Teresa uh, Delanges. So I don't know if you, anybody of these people that I mentioned want to ask a question or have something to say and contribute. And I think that, Cin that Cynthia is back. I'm back. Yes. <laughs> okay. I just asked if anybody, uh, if um, Carol or Catherine, Carol Cohn, Catherine Eschel, Sam Cook or Teresa Delanges have uh, a question or something to add to maybe the advice to the next generation of feminists. <laughs> Okay. Do you, um, thank you. I want to just say thank you um, to all the participants. Catherine said, I asked earlier in the chat if the participant could talk, participants could talk to how the treaty ban could be leveraged for feminists and others moving forward. And I think that some of this has been addressed. I think that our time is over though. Um, uh, Ray, if you want to put back the cover of your book, and I think, and I'm going to share again the link to the pre-ordering. I want to thank uh, Karina Lester, Maria Pia Devoto, Ray Hson, um, Cynthia, and Lo, and uh, all the participants here for for your questions. I want to thank Leila for hosting us and switching back and forth the microphone. Celia, uh, Omar Zdottir, and Kerry Ryling for organizing uh, IFJP. And I hope to see you at other panels and buy the book. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And Thank very you. nice meeting you all. Thank you very much. It yeah. was fantastic. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was amazing. Loved your talks. Oh, good. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks.